As we reported earlier, Britain has voted in its third parliamentary election since 2015. The choice was stark and could result in fundamental changes to British policy for generations. Nick Schifrin is here with the results. Analysts believe today was Britain's most consequential vote in a generation and perhaps since the Second World War. The choice was between a Conservative or Tory party whose slogan was Get Brexit Done and a Labour party that promised a second referendum on Brexit and a dramatic rewriting of the economy to make it more socialist. According to the exit polls, of 650 local districts, the Tories there on the left won 368, giving them a majority of 86. Labour won 191, which is a loss of 71 seats, the Scottish National Party at 55, and the Liberal Democrats at 13. This is the biggest conservative majority since 1987 and the worst labor result in 85 years. To discuss the results from London, Robin Niblett, the director of the British think tank, think tank Chatham House, and from Washington, Heather Conley, director of the Europe program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Welcome back to the news hour to you both. Robin Nibbett, let me start with you. This is an exit poll. It's a projection, but historically reliable. So assuming it's true, did Britons vote for Boris Johnson, for Brexit, uh, against Jeremy Corbyn, a little bit of all three? Um, I think definitely for Brexit uh, and definitely against Jeremy Corbyn, if these numbers uh, are to be seen correctly. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that those who want to see Brexit happen had one choice, which was to vote for the Conservative Party. Those who were stuck still on the Remain and wanting to rethink uh, how you could keep the UK somehow in the EU were split between uh, the Scottish National Party, between the Labour Party and the Lib Dems. And ultimately that divide, along as a deep suspicion of Jeremy Corbyn by many in the north of England, who have traditionally held up that Labour Party vote, really made this, uh, uh, if it's to be believed, uh, a, a big victory for, for Boris Johnson. And, and we saw Boris Johnson campaign in the north, uh, those traditional labor strongholds. Heather Conley, let me show some video here. Uh, this is uh, a styrofoam wall, uh, or Boris Johnson uh, getting into a, uh, into a bulldozer. All right, we don't have the, there it is. Jeremy, uh, Boris Johnson in a bulldozer, get Brexit done. The styrofoam wall said gridlock. The, the message, obviously, uh, blunt force uh, on Brexit. Is that what, Juan? Yeah, absolutely. Robin is right. This was a Brexit election. Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party wanted to make this about everything else but Brexit, about the National Health Care Service, about poverty, about improving social care. And the Brexit, I think the voters were just simply exhausted after three years. I think also many voters believe that the 26 referendum, 2016 referendum, um, that it was the democratic will of the British people, if, even if they didn't agree with it. And I think there was concern that uh, re running that or somehow trying to uh, to annul that decision was wrong. So there may not have been enthusiasm, but I think for the British people, they let's get on with this. Let's get Brexit done. Um, and they wanted to move forward. And again, this really means that there is no more left and right in the UK politically. It was really a, a leave or remain decision. And what is clear is that there is an overwhelming majority to leave the EU. And Mr. Johnson will get that done. Robin Niblett, the deadline is January 31st for Brexit. Is there any doubt now that Boris Johnson can meet that deadline? I'm, if the results are as they seem to be, anything, and it looks like a majority is, is pretty much certain, uh, then the UK will leave the EU by January the 31st, if not even a little bit before then. That is the ultimate deadline by which they uh, are entitled to leave. Of course, what then happens is that we enter a probably 12-month period in which the UK is somehow going to do a crash deal to complete a free trade agreement. Boris Johnson, at least by redrawing the Theresa May deal and creating a, a notional border down the Irish Sea, can try to push for a free trade agreement, which is a simpler type of agreement. But still, the UK is going to enter at least a 12-month period of really intense negotiations. The British will find out pretty quickly that actually uh, Brexit is a bit done. The UK is left, but actually the new agreement part of Brexit is just getting started. Heather Conley, it seems that that challenge is, is quite large. Uh, so January, uh, the Britain will leave the EU, begins a transitional period, uh, as Robin was just saying, the deadline for that is December 31st. But could we be back here in one year talking about Britain once again crashing out? 
We could. Um, so by July 1st, uh, the British government uh, has to request an extension of that transition period. Again, that, that's uh, to allow in case the future relationship uh, becomes very difficult. Uh, that's to allow a smoother process. But during the campaign, Boris Johnson refused uh, to offer any extension. He is going to, he told us to get this done. And Robin, again, is absolutely right. The complexities of negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU. The average time it takes to negotiate with the EU for any country is between seven to nine years. Uh, this is going to be incredibly fast. Uh, and Boris Johnson has said he does not want to be closely aligned with the EU in the future. He wants to diverge. And this is actually uh, very problematic and troubling for Northern Ireland, which although it will remain in the United Kingdom Customs Union, it will be treated differently. And over the campaign, uh, Prime Minister Johnson was challenged that there was going to be any paperwork or customs certifications as good passed between Northern Ireland and, and, the, and Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. We are about to see how complex this relationship really is. It won't be as simple as the Prime Minister has made it out to be. And I'm very fearful that this could really unleash some forces in Northern Ireland that could potentially destabilize uh, a very fragile uh, government that has not had a, has not had a power sharing government for three years. Robin Niblett, uh, you mentioned uh, Jeremy Corbyn, of course. Part of what he was uh, arguing for was a second referendum, but he also talked about nationalization, seizing 10% of large firms' equity, a four-day work week. Uh, ultimately, did Britons decide that his platform was too radical? I think for many uh, in the UK, it, it is too radical, uh, not necessarily for his base, not for many of the true believers in the future of the, the Labour Party. In a way, Boris Johnson not only was offering to the right of his party get Brexit done quickly, but he was promising to the other part of the party a one-nation Toryism, very different from Margaret Thatcher. What we could see is Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party, in a way, squatting on the middle ground of British politics for the next five years and forcing the Labour Party into a very brutal uh, civil war looking beyond Jeremy Corbyn between those who believe in his vision that you have to push further to the left and those who want to take a, a more centrist line to try to push uh, Boris Johnson back the other way. And of course, there could be lessons here even for the US election and people already trying to draw some parallels there. Just one last point, though, on the big challenge here. We've not talked about Scotland. The Scottish National Party regained from 35 to 55 seats out of 59. So we may have had a confirmation in England of the 2016 referendum to leave the EU, but we've had a repudiation of the 2014 referendum for Scotland to remain in the UK. You've got a very divided Scotland from the United Kingdom after this election. Robin Niblett of Chatham House, Heather Connolly of CSAS, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks to you both.